I'm here today with Saiganesh. We're continuing our conversations with millennials and we've been talking and continue to talk with the five of the primary next generation of leaders and um, I wanted to just say great souls who are part of taking Ananda into its next stage. So Saiganesh, I talked to, when we talked about how you got on the path and so on like that, we skipped over a really big part of your life, which was all the years that you've spent working primarily in Silicon Valley and the business community and the tech community. And I think that's an important part of the story. And partly, I, I mean, I've never really talked to you about it because even though you held that job, you were, my interface with you was entirely through Ananda. So why don't you start talking to me about when did you start working? Where did you work? What kind of work did you do? Sure. Um, I think I mentioned in my first interview, like most people of my age and uh, my origin, I went to college to do computer science engineering, That's and I started work. Yeah. I started working in India uh -huh. um, uh, in software. Uh, I worked in India only for a couple of years. After that, I decided to come to the U.S. And um, in the U.S., I went to. Um, I moved away from uh, core technology. I was not writing programs or code anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I went more into management. Um, I did my master's and then I started working in the Silicon Valley. First, I worked as a management consultant uh, in a job that required a lot of travel. It was fancy and glamorous. And uh, I got to travel uh, to two or three different locations every month and spend 20 nights in a hotel room. Uh, but it was really not serving me spiritually, just the, the whole vibration of travel and needing to be so ungrounded. And then I uh, give, that, give that just a little bit more energy. What do you mean it wasn't serving you spiritually? How how is that? How would you describe that? I think at that point in my life, I had just. Uh, I mean, I was already a disciple of Master because I had read the autobiography when I was in India and I was practicing uh, these teachings and meditation. When I'd come to Ananda, I was really deepening my own personal uh, sadhana practice, my daily meditations and practices of the techniques. I was trying to. Uh, do longer meditations. I just um, it uh, just when I came to Nanda, I got initiated into the Kriya Yoga technique. So I was trying to make all that a focus in my life. And uh, as it happened at that time, all my projects were on the East Coast or in Midwest. So uh, more than anything, just the time zone difference. But I think more importantly, the vibration of all those hotel rooms and things and all these spaces. As much as I was doing my best to keep a daily practice it was just proving very difficult. It was very difficult in those type of, uh, uh, in those rooms and with all the time zone differences to uh, stick to a regular sadhana routine. That was my primary challenge. Okay, so. so and then I started working for a tech company here in Silicon Valley and uh, I held on to that job for about four or more years. Mm -hmm. uh, and there I was a manager with uh, IT. Um, I was uh, in charge of, uh, relationship with a lot of vendors. I had a team in India that were doing some technical work. So I just did typical things that people do here in Silicon Valley. I was in the tech and I was uh, managing an IT team. And how big a company? Was it a large company, a small company? Yeah, it was a fortune finder company. Uh-huh. And so you were just one of a very large team? You weren't? Yeah. Yeah, I was not, I was not uh, way up high in the ladder or anything like that. I was mm -hmm. part of a very large team. And uh, you know, in um, Silicon Valley, it's very multicultural. Uh, certainly there are a lot of Indians, but also people don't even notice where you're from or uh -huh. uh, any of those differences. And also it's global. As much as I work in Silicon Valley, the way uh, we work these days is that you have teams in China and India and Europe. So you're constantly working across time zones. Nobody in Silicon Valley, I would say, I think I can make this generalization. Nobody can say they have a 10 to five or a nine to six or those type of typical working hours. Because if I have to talk to somebody in India, I'm gonna talk at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Or if I'm talking to somebody from UK, it's gonna be 7 a.m. So you sort of flow with it. And it's very global, very multicultural, and certainly part of a very large team. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and precisely, you sort of, you know, just threw out those words, but what does that actually mean? Does that mean you're, Working with with products, with people, with money. What are all of the above? Sure. I'll I'll tell what my specific role was. But of course, people there are people working with um, all those different aspects in a company. My role was to manage business relation, uh, provide technology solutions uh, to different business groups. Mm -hmm. And I would work with. I myself was not creating those programs or configuring them. 
but I would find the right solutions from the market. I would interface with the vendors. Uh, I would be a translator who understands what people need and uh, <laughs> so to speak the technical lingo uh, mm -hmm. with the developers or the vendors and sort of drive uh, that solution for them, um, mm -hmm. make it happen uh, mm -hmm. technology wise. So it sounds like it, it could be interesting. Was it, it was. Yeah, I think it was interesting. Um, I sort of, in, in the, speaking of me personally, I really like working with people um, in the work environment. That was certainly my strength. Uh, I could have done programming or more technical things. I was doing that in the past, but I, but I certainly enjoyed working with people. Um, I enjoyed um, business relationships. I was good at managing meetings, driving presentations. Those were my natural strengths. So mm -hmm. there was certainly a part of me that enjoyed being in that setting and being able to do all of that. Um, mm -hmm. It was fulfilling in its own way. Then why did you stop? <laughs> I think it was, it, first, I think we touched upon this a little bit in our first interview. It was certainly a gradual process um, of me uh, realizing that my life was going somewhere else and I would, uh, this would be more natural for me. But I think to give a briefer answer to your question, I think my own definition of personal fulfillment and where I was seeking it from was shifting. Mm -hmm. And it had changed that now I did not need that anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I could have done that. I had not reached a point. I know some people, uh, a lot of people in the Silicon Valley, they can have a kind of a satiation of where they reach a point either because of stress or because they're bored with what they're doing, or they've reached the pinnacle of whatever it is that they were trying to do that they now need to look for something else. I don't think I belong in that category. For me, it was all working out and it was going quite fine. And as you know, I was able to balance other aspects of personal life and spirituality and job and all of that as well I was able to, as well as I was able to. But I think the best answer is that the way in which I was defining my personal fulfillment and how I was seeking it shifted, and I just did not need it anymore. And this was a better way and of serving and a better use of my time and energy. It was very clear to me that this would help me grow spiritually, uh, go deeper in my own relationship with my spiritual path. So it was a natural decision. But let's go back and say, my sense of fulfillment was shifting. Why don't you define what, what was your sense of fulfillment before, before it shifted? What would you have called it? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are many aspects to it. And I think I speak for myself, but also perhaps for a lot of people like me. I think there's money, certainly. Uh, when somebody is seeking career or somebody is seeking to work in a job or looking for um, the right opportunity for themselves, money is part of it. But I don't think as much as it was part of that reality, I don't think I was ever greedy or that was not the first motivation. I think if I were to really think about it, you know, I think things that we look for, the recognition, the sense of purpose, uh, feeling important, feeling valued, feeling recognized, all of those were ways in which I was feeling fulfilled. And mm -hmm. this was a setting where I could, I could contribute and receive that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I think that's, true for me and perhaps for most people who are working in a setting like that, because you do want to feel valued. You want to feel a little important. I don't mean that in an egotistical way, but mm -hmm. just that you want to have a sense of purpose for yourself. You want to feel needed. Mm -hmm. And um, how it shifted, I don't know if you asked that question. But, but I'm, going to, I'm going to actually back up just a little yeah. bit. You were already a disciple when you were doing all that work. So before it shifted and you wanted to do something else, how did you, now you're not living in hotel rooms, so you can meditate more, but how did being a disciple, did you leave it behind when you went into business or were you working for master when you were working for business? <laughs> how did it work? Yeah, that is, an, that is a very important question because I don't think it happened overnight. Um, certainly I discovered master through the autobiography of a yogi and my awareness of being a disciple that's how i think about it that was very sudden that was very very sudden uh, i immediately recognized uh, the teachings of yogananda and this particular path as my own as and soon that as was, I, that was back when you were in india that was back when i was in india were you still so, in college at that point or were you out of college by then? 
I was out of college. Mm-hmm. I had already tried a few different things. I was like we discussed in the previous, in our first interview, I was into a lot of spiritual things naturally, just out of personal interest. Um, so I was trying meditation. I perhaps visited every ashram that I could possibly get into, tried different techniques, classes. Mm-hmm. I was only 22 or 23. So it feels a little odd to say that I have tried a lot by that time, but I really had. I had even traveled a lot and tried a lot of things. And when I read the autobiography of Yogi, it was it was groundbreaking. It was mm-hmm. it was something that I was being aware of. And I was just clear in that moment that this was mine. I didn't need to look anymore. That's mm-hmm. how I described it to myself. Mm-hmm. As much as re- I recognized and identified as a disciple right at that moment, there was I didn't have to go through a process of accepting discipleship. But the process of integrating it into my life was very slow. Ah, interesting. Because there's a lot of momentum. You know how, um, <laughs> you know, there's this chant that we often uh, think about or talk about in this respect, I want only the Lord, the only the. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, that's really the process. It's, it's an affirmation, but also an acknowledgement of how we are not there yet. So what you're, what you're referring to is, I mean, which I have said and others have said, that even as I sing, I want only the Lord, my subconscious mind says, who are you kidding? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That what you're referring to? Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. But also sometimes we don't even have that awareness that Uh we are in fact invested in seeking so many things other than God. And even now I'm pretty sure there's a lot in my own subconscious that's needing fulfillment of a different sort that I don't yet fully believe can just come from God. Right. And the reason I bring that up is, it was a gradual awareness for me, a building of awareness for me to realize all the things that I wanted. I wanted a good job. I wanted to look important. I wanted to get a good degree. I wanted to be the top in my class. I wanted to uh, do this job well. I wanted to you know, speak well, uh, make this presentation. I wanted to talk to you know, these people that were big in the industry or whatever that was. I wanted to clear this interview and prove to myself, prove to others, all this momentum is there. And I, I, I think in that sense, I was on that track. If I had not read the autobiography of Yogi, I don't think, um, I'm sure my life would have just panned out the same way, but I can easily imagine a situation or a possibility where if I had not embraced the spiritual path that I could have walked that road seeking all those things mm-hmm. and finding all those things along the way. So, mm-hmm. To your question, how did I integrate or how was I being a disciple? I think for me, it was a gradual process of growth. Uh, it was not that I was being a disciple in the corporate way this in this particular way. Every day I was discovering. Mm-hmm. I think one of the ways I describe it to myself, I remember this thought used to come to me very often. Uh, I had this opportunity in my job to often make presentations to executives or be mm-hmm. in the presence of people that were Uh, way high up on the ladder. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would just sit in that room with 30 people or 32 people and think, I'm a disciple of Paramhansa Yogananda and I'm a Kriya Yogi, but no one in this room cares. (laughs) 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 But it is such an important part of my own identity. Uh It was important for me, but it was so irrelevant (laughs) for anybody else Mm -hmm. in that room. And I started asking, what does that mean? What does that mean to be a disciple and a Kriya Yogi and sitting here and doing this? And I think this was the answer that came to me often at different times. I approached it differently. But one of the things I do remember now is it gave me context. I I could see myself as playing a role, uh, but I was playing it well. I didn't need to be indifferent to the role while having a better context behind me. The fact that I was a disciple was still the primary identity that I always had in my mind for myself. But now I am this IT manager making a presentation for this new product to the executives and making case, making a case for taking this particular direction. And now I'm trying to convince them I'm answering questions. Now all these things are happening in this room. They don't care that I'm a disciple. But for me, that's all there was. I'm a disciple, but I'm now playing this role. The others in the room did not have that context. I don't know if that's making sense, but no, somehow yeah. it was useful for me. I want to ask further questions. Did you feel, therefore, superior, separate from the other people? Did you feel isolated? Did you feel lonely? I mean, were there any other feelings like that? 
um, I don't think I ever felt superior, uh-huh. but there were a lot of times where I felt isolated. Uh, not, I, I mean, I'm thinking about this just as you asked that, as you asked that question. All the other emotions perhaps pass through me at different points based on the setting. Like, for example, I generally refrain from having initially in the earlier part of my work life, I would um, socialize a little bit more. I would have lunch with people, but later on, as I got busier and as I was more absorbed in a lot of do- things at Ananda or in my own life. Um, I did not feel like I needed to do that. So for others, it might have certainly looked like I was isolating myself. Uh, Uh, It did not feel isolating to me personally, but I was becoming more and more conscious of the fact um, that there is such a distance, there's such a discrepancy in my reality and the reality of those around me. But also, it, um, it also opened my heart in a different way. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I wouldn't often share with people um, what I was doing, my own spiritual path, or actually all the people knew because either because they've seen something online or mentioned this or that, and um, this would it would come up more often than I would even imagine. Um, and it always gave a window to tell them that yeah, it's just something I do, and it's really important to me. That's what I do outside of work, and you know it's really helpful, mm-hmm. and. To them, it might have looked like I'm just talking from where they are. It's just like I have all the things that they have in their life and also this one other thing. Um, but I'm, I hope I'm making sense here. But it was also connecting me with people in a different way because they were seeing me differently sometimes. I didn't want it that way, but it was inevitable. That you have to finish that thought. Connecting people in a different way. Did you become the small guru of your office? <laughs> I mean, seriously, is, how, how did it How did it? connect you in a different way. Yeah, I don't think people, <laughs> you know, there are always gurus in the office. There are always people that I would go to when I didn't know what uh, medical insurance option to pick. <laughs> <laughs> and there are always people that I went to if I, I mean, I'm not talking about work questions. I'm talking about in, in a work office setting, you know, like, you know, I'm trying to sell my property. I'm going to buy a new car. I don't know which one to pick. Oh, there's this guy in that team. He knows all about cars. He knows what's important, you okay. know. In that way, you know, there's always this. I always had my guy who I went to whenever I was so confused during annual enrollment, I had to pick next year's dental and medical and vision plans and there was four options. I had no idea. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, people did approach me if they were looking for meditation or especially, you know, once I told everybody that I have this habit of taking a week-long seclusion every year. And this was the funniest part of working in corporate. I remember I told my manager, I'm going to be in seclusion. And I know I'm generally always on email. People can really rely on me uh, to be responsive. Uh, And if anything goes wrong, they know I'll be there. And I told my manager, I'm going to be off email. I'm not going to have my laptop with me. And then a couple of days later, she came to me and asked, but you're going to check your emails, right? (laughs) (laughs) No, actually, I'm not going to. (laughs) I'm I'm not even going to have phone signal. And even if I did, I'm not even going to switch my phone on. I'm really going to be in seclusion. I'm just going to be meditating. And I had to tell this to everybody who I was constantly interfacing with, especially this one year. It might have been 2015 or something, because there was a big project going on. I had to write an email to everyone saying, guys, I'm not just taking time off. I'm literally not going to have my phone with me. And I'm really, really not going to check emails. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, you know, from that point, somehow everybody remembered I was the guy who doesn't check email for a week every year. <laughs> that, would, that would make you stand out. I can see <laughs> It was so natural. It would have been so natural in my world, in the Ananda world, for me to do something like that. But it was, I just realized that how unusual it was for them. And after that, I mentioned that example because people would often come to me. I'm looking to take a break. I heard that you go on retreats and stuff. Do you have any suggestions for me? And actually, I sent two or three people from my work expanding light retreat. <laughs> um, so it, it, is, it is something that you know, people do think you are, you know something about this, so they can come to you about this topic if they have questions. And and that made a warmer connection with people, yeah. more positive, because you brought more of your actual reality into the relationship would be a way to say it, correct? Exactly. That really, uh, that, that gave a better context for us to interact, because mm-hmm. I cannot talk to you about the game 
last weekend, I ha- I cannot talk to you about, uh, you know, buying property in Dublin, <laughs> but I can talk to you about uh, meditation because, you know, in workplace, these are all the, con- there's a set of conversations that people have. Mm-hmm. And increasingly, that's what I was mentioning as isolating. It was impossible for me to plug into those conversations. Any non-work related conversation between two or three people was impossible for me to plug into. Either it's about their kids' school or about real estate or cars or games or parties or whatever it was. All of that was so far outside of my reality that it was just becoming alien. And so this would lead us to why don't you work there anymore? (laughs) So so what happened? What made you suddenly or or gradually feel that, that you had to integrate your life in a different way? Well, the opportunity to do that, uh, which uh, which really, really, uh, you know, when the when I realized that there was the opportunity to do that, then I did not think about it. It was most natural and the obvious thing to do. But what really, uh, you know, just to give tell you more about that gradual process, part of it was career, money, just trying to. A lot of it was my own vibration shifting, my spirit, uh, you know, growing spiritually. That's the only way to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just rationalizing in my own mind, um, you know, why do I need this? Why do I need that? Why do I need this? Why do I need that? Do I really think I want this? I, I want to spiritually grow. And I also want this promotion. How can they coexist? And mm-hmm. till a certain point, like the Pandavas and the Karvas, you're trying to see that you somehow assume that you're going to make peace between these two. And some people can, you know, to a large extent, they can hold on to things because it's not necessarily two opposing directions. For me, they were opposing directions mm-hmm. because it was not just that I was in the corporate world, but I was actually also seeking the things that people seek in the corporate world. Mm-hmm. That could not coexist with my spiritual aspiration. So working in the corporate world can perfectly coexist. But how we prioritize what we want in life, uh, given this opportunity, what would you do? Um, do you really want more money or would you like to have more time to meditate or go deeper? Would you like to have opportunities to be off email for a whole week every year? So things like that. It became more and more obvious to me that this was the right direction. And if I really wanted the things, if I really wanted to have the things I was seeking, this really was the route that I needed to take, whether now or later. There was no question there um, that I needed to put those behind me. And part of what has to be said is that karmically you were free. Mm-hmm. You, yeah. you, you know, you didn't have wife, you didn't have children, you didn't have house payments. Yeah. I mean, sometimes a person could come to that realization, but God wouldn't give them that realization until they were already deeply committed. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. That's what I meant by the opportunity. I didn't clarify that. Yeah, the opportunity I had because these were just desires. There was really no real need for these things in my life. Uh, I mean, I didn't really need, uh, you know, the next best best job, or I didn't really need more and more and more money. It's right. not going to give me anything. Right. And so, how was it? Was it sudden? Was it overnight? Was it gradual? How How did you come to walk away from it? I think I, I certainly. I think. I think we, this is how I explain it to myself. I think we have so many levels in which we ourselves exist. On some levels, it's sudden. On some level, it's gradual. Sometimes you think it's sudden, but then you realize it's not. <laughs> so I in, think other words, <laughs> in other words, it's like chaos, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think it's, it is gradual. That is the truth. But also it is sudden because sometimes you have to take drastic steps in your life because you have to flip the switch, so to speak, in order for you to open to new realities so you can gradually then work through them. Um, So it is both sudden and gradual. Uh, I think even sometimes, you know, to be perfectly honest, if I were to share, sometimes I would think about the fact that, wow, I do not have the financial freedom I did maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. I would just, I I have to really think about how I look at money now. Mm -hmm. And it, it, Maybe there's a part that just asks for a tiny second then, wow, wouldn't it be good if you had more financial freedom? Uh (laughs) You know, and that is very gradual. That's very, very gradual because we have a lot of momentum invested, not just in the first 25 years of our life, but Mm -hmm. through incarnations of seeking these things. So it's being watchful, being aware, using our common sense and discrimination, uh, and also doing our best to grow in the direction we want to. Have you had uh, 
terrifying moments as you've made this transition? I mean, you sort of referred to it. Has it been just, oh, ha ha, there's just a new way of thinking? Or has <laughs> it been, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, certainly. I did have a lot of terrifying moments. Um, my, ter my terror, I mean, it might vary from person to person. For a lot of, for some people, it might have been money or job or this. And for me, it was just like having lost some grounding because I was standing on such solid ground uh, where I knew what my skills were. I knew what my credentials were. I knew what job I was in. I really, I knew how to do it well. I knew even if I wanted a different job, I could just go out and I could get one in three days, in two weeks. Um, so there was just this, um, just this entire uh, structure of security that mm -hmm. I was standing on. And for me, just uh, my transition was losing that and realizing that, oh my gosh, <laughs> where am I standing right now? It's not that I, I didn't even feel like, I mean, that the terror was, had very less to do with money or um, career or the exact role or job, but just realizing that I've really, I invested myself for about 15 years in getting to where I was. And then one fine day, one fine morning, I woke up and I just said, I don't want it anymore. What, mm -hmm. am I sure? <laughs> what am I going to do without it? <laughs> so that is terrifying. Uh, was well, terrifying, certainly. And sometimes I do think about, I mean, I don't think I, if I were to be honest also, I don't think it's at all as terrifying to me right now as it was in the first few months of making that transition. How did you get through that? I think time uh, is, is an answer. Um, <laughs> but also just grace. Uh -huh. I think um, I was trying my best and I think um, I was doing my best to, to, to focus more on my own goal and aspiration, uh, uh -huh. focus on why I was doing what and not what I was doing. Right. Uh, that really, really helped uh, right. because when you have the answers to that why, then mm -hmm. the what is no longer as overwhelming. Right. Um, and I think grace is really the answer. I mean, I don't want to be glib about it, but it's just that I, I don't know. I'm just not as terrified about it anymore. I mm -hmm. think I just needed some time to get used to new realities and I just needed to pray and go deeper. <laughs> exactly. Well, of course, that's the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. But Grace is, you know, it's, it's remarkable when you're in it. Swami said the reason that people think hell is eternal is because when you're in it, it feels like it is. <laughs> <laughs> but when... Yeah. When you're out of it, you just look back and think, wow, what was that all about? Yeah, absolutely. But, but not when you're in it. When you're in it, it's <laughs> no. very yeah. self-evident. It's, it's the most dramatic example of the dream nature of the world, <laughs> I think. But I'm very, I'm very glad to, to understand all this. So do you feel, now here's another question that people would ask. Do you feel that you're wasting your talent now, that you had all this talent and ability that was being used and now it's not being used or is it being used or how, yeah. how do you think about like that? Yeah, I'm, I don't know what answer I can give to people if when people ask me this question, I probably, <laughs> depends on the person, but to myself, uh, this is how I explain it to myself. I almost find that question um, silly mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, because I, I really, this is how I explain it to myself. Um, all that I've received in this life has come through grace. Mm -hmm. You know, all my talents, all that I was able to achieve, at least in my own personal example, I did. I wouldn't, if I were to be completely honest, I don't think I had to, you know, just really struggle uh, mm -hmm. like some people have to, to reach a place in their life or to have financial stability or things like that. Everything that came to me came through grace. Mm -hmm. I, so I really honestly don't feel like I, they were mine. Mm -hmm. uh, they were given to me and now something else is being given to me mm -hmm. and what I really value and which I try to stand by is to see how I'm being fulfilled and to pursue that but yeah it is very surprising for people and now that you ask it's just like oh wow you would do so well <laughs> if you were going to do this you would be so good at this you could easily go get a job there why wouldn't you do that it just, just doesn't make any sense but at the same time I think about all that just came to me. Mm -hmm. I, I did not struggle for it. And um, Divine Mother gave me those things for a certain reason, for a certain time. And now she's giving me something else. Mm -hmm. And um, this is more fulfilling, fulfilling to me right now, where I sit and what I do. Um, 
And so it, I don't even think about what else I could be doing or what else I'm good at because I don't think I am good at anything. I'm a musician. And sometimes people would say, you know, you haven't had as much training as some others, but you sing so well. Then I think about the fact that I am not singing. It's just one fine day I can wake up and I might not be able to sing at all. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about it. So mm -hmm. one fine day I'll wake up and I will not have these things that I consider valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't even know how to respond to that question within myself. I do tell, I do give people an answer, but sharing honestly with you, I really don't think any of these things that I consider my talents or my gifts uh, are really mine. Uh, they were given to me for a purpose and the where I'm standing now and what's in front of me is really my goal right now and to do that to the best of my abilities. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all that. That was very enlightening. <laughs> Thank you, Asha. Always fun chatting this way. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sai Ganesh. God bless you. Happy Moksha Day. <laughs> Happy Moksha Day to you too. All right.